welcome to Hawk Talk and HTA podcast. I'm Alex Jenkins and I'm your host for today and this is episode two and we are looking at plant health. I'm joined today by three very special guests and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Hi everybody, I'm Sally Kellymore. I'm the policy manager here at HTA and for my sins, I the main thrust of my job is to influence government. Um, I have a government facing role and part of that role is to address plant health issues for our industry. Thank you. And I'm Pippa Greenwood and I'm the horticulture manager. So unlike Sally, I deal with all the interesting stuff, the living plants and the lovely growers (laughs) that produce them all. And I steer well clear of policy, but I do have a serious background in plant health because I trained as a plant pathologist. Thank you, Pippa. Well, and hello, my name is uh, Alistair Yeomans. Uh, my, my focus is probably more on trees. Um, I was once a working arborist. Um, I'm also a chartered forester, so I've done a lot of work in woodland management and um, a lot of the um, plant health knowledge that I've um, gained over the years has really come from the uh, the sort of tree and woody context so to speak. Thank you very much Alistair and thank you all for agreeing to join me today. So let's kick off our discussion and we're going to start with a bit of a broad question so feel free to just jump in there. What is plant health? What do we mean by plant health when we talk about it in the context of our industry? Oh, silence. (laughs) He's going to go first. (laughs) Okay, well, it's keeping plants healthy. It's making sure that, you know, the same way that you don't want to succumb to every cold and flu bug that's passing around when you go and do your shopping, it's for us. It's making sure that all the plants that are out there that are being grown for people to then buy from garden centres or to have in their own gardens. So whether you're the producer of the plant or the seller of the plant or the person who's got it in their garden or the local park, you don't want to have it full of unhappy, unhealthy plants. You want to have your plants as healthy as possible. And that's basically all it means. Uh, how can you not agree with that statement? <laughs> you can add some boring policy into it. I sorry. could add boring policy stuff. Yeah, I could say. Yeah. <laughs> We'd like to, be able to maintain the biosecurity of the UK and we need to have certain measures in place to make sure you have to. <laughs> I, I could add to it a wee bit, which is, um, and it, I entirely agree with Pippa, it's, it's really what, what causes a plant to be healthy or unhealthy. Um, and I think, uh, I'm sure that's something we'll come on to, but um, is it a, a, another biological agent like a bacteria or a virus or fungus? Or is it something that's actually just um, in the physical environment, like it's been planted too shallow or hasn't had enough water? Um, so I think there's, you know, once once somebody has established that a plant isn't healthy, then it's trying to understand and piece together why that's the case. So it's not just about the wee beasties. It's also <laughs> about, you know, what you do with it and how you how you care for a plant as well. And also, really, I think how you avoid it, how you avoid coming across plant health problems, isn't it? That's all part of the the key to making it work from our point of view, isn't it? It's it's avoiding these things. Yeah, absolutely. I I think the the word um, proactive is really important. It's having that imagination to um, understand when a plant is put in the the landscape or a garden, what are the uh, potential problems? ailments that it may come up against really um and i think that's that's a really important point Pippa's made is having that imagination that's fantastic thank you for that great overview right let's dive straight into what Pippa calls the boring bit policy sally what is the link between plant health and policy and what are the things that we should be aware of if someone says oh what do you do in policy to do with plant health then immediately springs into my mind is um, communication with government and governance agencies. So it's about how we speak to DEFRA um, and what they're planning to do in the future regarding plant health and how, um, from a HTA point of view and my, my own job's point of view, um, 
how that might affect our members, how that might affect our industry. So um, that's why it's really important that we understand what the implications are for any rules or regulations that might come in, um, but that we understand what the individual pests and diseases and the legislation that the government brings in how that actually then goes and affects the industry so what might they have to do what hoops might they have to jump through do we need to jump through those hoops so to me in my job it's about influencing government to make sure any decisions they take they bear in mind the industry and also make sure that um, the steps are necessary doesn't always happen to be fair <laughs> but they're getting better at it <laughs> with your help with your help Sally they're getting better at with it. everybody's help yes yeah. we've all got a part to play in it you know if, if, no, if nobody comes along and says this rule that they're thinking of bringing in the government um that's going to really affect my industry that's going to affect my business you know I, it's too onerous and I don't necessarily think we need to do it. I mean, we need to take those points of view on board and make sense of them and evaluate them, um, make sure they're translated into easily understandable plant health regulation, which I'm sure both Alistair and Pippa would agree, plant health regulation isn't the easiest thing to uh, wade through. I think it's a fine line though, isn't it? It's the sort of, it's the balancing between yes, this is what needs to happen and, and it mustn't affect the industry, which is so important, but also making sure that any rules and regulations, whether they affect you and I going on holiday and the fact that we shouldn't be bringing little bits of plant cuttings back in our sponge bags and hidden in our <laughs> coat pockets, um, or in fact bringing anything back at all like that, or whether it's something that's that's sort of going to then affect you if you're growing the plants that it, it does mean that you're not bringing in all these things that could cause a lot more problems. So it's sort of balancing the effect it has on the industry, isn't it, with making sure that it stops new pests and diseases coming into the country or that if we do get pests and diseases here that are already established, we know how to keep on top of them, to keep them in check or keep them at a manageable level, isn't it? It's that sort of balancing. Yeah, absolutely. And it is um, it, it does come from um, an international framework, which is the International Plant Protection Convention. So there is this sort of um, global um, recognized and agreed framework to the, the movement of plants and um, managing plant biosecurity. So basically, when a plant is moved, it, um, it can bring um, in certain cases, if it isn't um, looked after properly, it can bring pests from one area to another to introduce a, a new pest into an area where it wasn't before. Um, and so DEFRA in this country are our competent authority or the National Plant Protection Organization. Uh, and as I say, they, they, they work to a, um, a wider framework and hopefully well with all the other um, competent authorities um, across the world that um, we trade with and of course with Brexit um, we are it, it's likely that we may trade more freely with countries that we may not have done so um, much so in the past. So let's let's mention Brexit, EU exit with a lot of other things that have been happening over the last 12, 18 months. What do you think are the big things that that have come out of that when it comes to plant health? The biggest thing is that we were before the 1st of January 2021, inside the EU plant health area. So <clears throat> apart from the fact there were certain what's called national measures that each individual country could impose if they didn't have a particular pest or disease, um, they could put in mitigation measures or, or measures to help um, stop a certain pest and disease coming in from another EU country. Um, we could trade pretty freely in plants and plant material. It, there weren't a huge amount of hoops to go through. We had an EU-wide plant passporting system um, that was introduced wholeheartedly in 2019. And then a year after, we're now relying on um, inspections either side of borders, um, phytosanitary certificates, pre-notification, customs declarations. So being outside of that, that EU plant health area has actually meant that we've now 
some might say that we may even have closed the borders too much um, and it is posing some difficulties in getting plant material into and out of Great Britain because there's different rules from Northern Ireland and you can very quickly get very technical with this subject <laughs> very quickly. Is there anything we can do to make it easier now or is it have we gone have we gone that step too far? Potentially yes there are some things that we could be doing um, we should really, from a HTA point of view, we agree with seeking some sort of plant health agreement with the EU because there are certain what's called non-tariff barriers, which are basically barriers to trade that don't involve sticking a tariff on something. So that could be obtaining a phytosanitary certificate or having an inspection at, the, at a border, um, various other barriers to actually allowing smooth trade. There are some things that we could agree with the EU that would not compromise our biosecurity of the UK. So what is biosecurity? We bandy that word about a lot, don't we? Um, and it literally means not bringing in or sending out any nasties um, into, into the country that you, you wish to maintain that level of biosecurity about. Um, but there are certain measures that we can use to ease trade and through an agreement with the EU that would still maintain or even enhance biosecurity, but smoothing out those non-tariff barriers that I mentioned earlier. So what do you mean, Sally, things like perhaps getting to the situation where we could have plants inspected uh, in another country that was going to import those plants to the UK. And we could then say, well, they've been inspected over there. We trust the people that have inspected them to have done a really good job, check there were no pests or diseases or eggs of those pests or anything lurking on there. And, and now we know they're clean, so we don't have to go through all the rigmarole again this end. Is that the sort of thing you had in mind? Because I, I think that would be so much easier. It, it certainly is one of the things that we could agree on. Um, it is about ensuring there is trust between the individual uh, plant protection organisations, the competent authorities in the various countries that we're talking about. There has to be that level of trust. And if you have an agreement that says we do trust you, we trust your plant health practices, but allowing individual countries such as Great Britain to say, but we're not so sure about XYZ pest. We are going to check for that. We do want a phytosanitary certificate for item A and item B, but the rest of it, we trust you on it. Yeah, and exactly. We'll with it. Yeah, absolutely. That's certainly one of the things. Um, and the other thing is not requiring multiple inspections, both sides. So one side, this side, and then if you're exporting, exporting, if you're sending plants to Northern Ireland, you then have to have another inspection to send them there. It's just, it seems a crazy situation um, that involves lots of inspections that could, I'm not saying they do, but could end up in a box ticking exercise rather than actually having true biosecurity. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that. I, I really think it comes down to um, evidence-based phytosanitary measures mm -hmm. and making sure that those systems are designed on strong evidence, really understanding the host organism that you're dealing with, i.e. what plant it may be, um, and what the pest threats are to that um, plant, and then ensuring that the measures are in place to um, without any doubt or with very minimal doubt, know that that plant is a is a, a clean, um, healthy plant. And that's essentially lowering risk to an acceptable level. And that's really what the, the whole basis of international um, plant movement is based on. It's called um, achieving an appropriate level of protection. So it's a risk-based system. And it's really just being sensible and um, uh, making sure that the systems that are used uh, are, are scientifically um, accurate and work. And don't you think it's so important as well to, and you're saying you need to know the host plants really well, but it's so important to also know everything you might need to know about each pest and each 
pathogen as well. So each disease causing organism or each pest, because, you know, I, I always have this concern that every time you say unload a lorry load of plants to inspect them to see if there are uh, pests on there when they're being imported, um, most pests have wings and legs and other means of getting about. So each time you do that, there's also an increased chance that they might, if they do have pests on them, those pests might escape or the spores might get wafted off or similarly something might waft in and land on them. So I think it's also really important to understand how all the pests and the pathogens move so that you can maybe take slightly different measures depending on what you're looking for. Yeah, yes, definitely. It's, it's a two-way street. You've got to know the, the, the pests that um, attack the plants and vice versa, the, um, the, the plants and what, what pests they're susceptible to. And understanding the biology from both ends is, is really key to them being able to map out the, the pathways that they can come into the, the country on, or, or move from one country to another or one area to another. I, I'm... I'm loving Pippa's use of the word waft. So <laughs> waft and waft, love that. Um, but also my question back to you, Alistair, is um, how do we know that then? So if if I worked in a garden centre or I was new to nursery, the nursery um, business, how do I actually know where to look? What, where do I get to find this stuff out? Because it all seems very complicated and there's thousands of different plants we grow and, and thousands of different pests and diseases how do I match them all up what how do I make sense of it you need to buy a copy of my book Sally <laughs> Shameless Sign plug. copies are available no don't, don't be a joke. <laughs> yeah it's really difficult I agree Sally because there are so many plants and so many pests and so many pathogens and then you know even when you've got your head round identifying some of these problems and that you know is is what i trained in it, it's made even more complex by the fact that at certain times of year something like say oak processionary moth or the caterpillars of that which is is the pest that we know that devastates things the problem is it's not in an obvious form because you might just say have eggs there won't be any caterpillars about so then how would you necessarily easily spot those or there are all those things that are asymptomatic i mean with the dreaded covid you know we hear that i think isn't it one in three in people or something yeah. have it and don't realize well it's the same with plants and with something like xylella the the new bacterial problem or relatively new that we're so trying so very hard to stop getting into this country you know so many of the plants actually don't show symptoms initially and they could then look perfectly handsome and lovely and in really good health and still be bringing a problem in. So it's a really hard nut to crack. So what should we be doing? What do we all need to do to make a difference? I think everyone needs to keep their eyes open at all times. I mean, whether it's, you know, you and I going to a, a lovely, really good quality local nursery or garden centre to buy plants, or it's looking at the plants in our own garden, we need to keep our eyes open for new things. And then regularly check and and obviously if you're a, a grower of plants most of our growers are amazingly well informed but even then you can't expect everyone to recognize every pest or disease that might come into their nursery or might be imported on a plant or they might see when they're in their own gardens but it's trying to keep yourself up to date and I think you know one of the best things you can do is being involved with, with something like Plant Healthy or OHAS one of those certification schemes which will ensure that your knowledge or, or someone at least within your company's knowledge is really good when it comes to pests, diseases and biosecurity. And I mean, that's plant healthy specialization, isn't it, Alistair? Yeah, and I, I suppose that's the, the, it's the, the plant health management standard, which is the, the standard which the plant healthy certification scheme is based on and has, has also been um, aligned with the OHAS grower standard. And really what that is, is a set of um, um, principles, which um, if a, a nursery or horticultural business implements into their systems, actually tackles a lot of the problems without having to have an in-depth knowledge of every single pest and every single disease. The, there are PhDs, just to give you an idea of how in-depth the subject is, there are PhDs done on just one pest-host relationship 
yet there's over a thousand pests on the UK plant health risk register. So we can't expect every horticulturalist, not only to know every plant that um, we can grow in our, our gardens, but also all the pests and diseases as well. So these standards um, have been designed to just help people do the right things in terms of biosecurity and phytosanitary measures to stop um, a, a pest moving around from one nursery to another, wherever it may be, whether it's national or international. And in that sense, there's a very similar parallel to human biosecurity in terms of um, COVID, the principles that we employ to stop the transmission of um, the uh, coronavirus. Do you know what? I do actually instantly make a connection between the coronavirus and plant health. The last 12, 14 months have made us so aware of disease, of how disease is spread and has really given us that kind of awareness of how to take care of ourselves and the steps that we need to take in everyday life. And now, do you think that actually if we could bring that awareness into the plant world as well, it would really help this cause? I think, yeah, it's so easy to think, oh, well, it's just a plant. And I think a lot of people do that. And obviously it depends where you are. But you know, if you go for a, a walk somewhere in an area at the moment where they're were a lot of ash trees thriving a few years back. And you now see the, the effect of this horrible yeah. ash dieback disease and, and what the effect that's had on just literally the, the sort of skyline in some places. It's heartbreaking. And, you know, a few years ago, people were talking about Dutch elm disease and, and that really had a dramatic effect on the landscape. Now, even if you don't live somewhere where there are lots of, well, there were lots of elms or there were lots of ash trees, you've got to kind of think ahead to whatever the next thing might be going to be and you've got to think about the fact that if all these things are gradually taken out by pests or diseases or spoilt we're not going to have them and whether you go and visit the countryside just for a walk or for a holiday or you, whether you live in it or whether you've got lovely trees in your local park it still has a devastating effect on the landscape and you know we're a nation of, of garden lovers and of plant lovers and I think it's really important to all of us. And I don't want to sort of sound too gushy and airy fairy, but plants for me and for a lot of us, I think are really what make us tick. And even if they're not what your job involves, as they are for me and Sally and Alistair in one way or another, they just make you feel happier. They make you feel better. And if you start taking them out or seeing them dying, it doesn't feel great. And, and I think we've got to think about that in everything we do. We want to keep our plants healthy. We want to keep them looking good. And the easiest way to do that isn't to grab some chemical spray or a biological control. It's to stop them getting in and attacking our plants in the first place. Plants do so much for us. I, I completely echo what Pippa says. And ultimately, we just need to positively think what we can do for our plants in return, really. And that's sort of it. And if we can do it proactively ahead of time, then the problem doesn't happen. And it's probably one of the, the strongest conservation measures that we can do. And as I say, we've seen that with ash dieback. Unfortunately, that did um, come into the country. I think it would have come into the country anyway, because I think it would have um, wafted in on the wind. Good word, <laughs> that. I love the word. I, I, <laughs> so I, I just like the word waft. <laughs> word of the day, waft. I think it, I think it would have blown in, that the evidence um, suggests it would have blown in anyway on the, mm. on, on the wind. And, and therein, uh, an understanding that we really need to have between the different um, ways plant pests and diseases move. Some plant pests can move um, very quickly um, across the country like ash die back because that's wind blown. Um, others may move much more slowly um, in the case of some um, insects where they can actually um, remain in quite a small area. Um, and, and if they have been introduced, potentially be eradicated. Um, and thankfully, um, there was, we, we did manage to eradicate one introduction of um, Asian longhorn beetle um, that came to the country in 2012. It was just eradicated last year. Now, if that hadn't been caught um, that, and it had spread, that could really have um, caused a lot of damage because it's uh, what is known as a polyphagous pest, which means it um, essentially eats lots and lots of trees. 
So, um, <laughs> po- poly meaning that was a big many, word. That was a big word, Alistair. Yum, yum, yum. <laughs> <laughs> so, now as of 2020, we've got 3 million new gardeners in the UK. And very soon we are hoping that we'll be able to go on foreign holidays again. What do we say to these new gardeners to put them off bringing back plants from all these exotic locations when they're abroad? What are the consequences of that? It could be desperate. That's the answer, isn't it? You can do a really little thing like see one plant in a local market or a garden centre when you're on holiday or in somebody's garden or think, oh, I just like take a little cutting of that. And you think, or you might think, it doesn't matter. But in reality, you could be bringing in one huge disaster on one tiny little bit of plant. And I've really got absolutely no time for anyone <laughs> who does it. I, I think it is the most extraordinarily stupid thing to do. I and I don't use the word then. stupid <laughs> lightly. <laughs> I really, really, it, it's not like you don't know. You've been told the signs are up there. And, you know, I remember years ago, I was taking a garden tour around a lovely cactus garden in uh, Lanzarote. And one of my group, much to my embarrassment, got up in amongst these extraordinary cacti and then thinking he was going to pinch one complained to me that his hand was riddled with thorns and bleeding badly and he is I've never given anyone such short shrift because he thought on my gardening tour he was going to pinch a cactus a totally unforgivable and b take it back with him into England when I was in his company I mean Okay, we don't grow that many cacti over here, but it's the principle and you don't know just because it's on a cactus, it could come on to something totally different. That does happen sometimes. So please think because it could have devastating consequences. Pippa won't be happy. Uh -uh. That's karma for you. (laughs) Yeah. I I was absolutely thrilled with what had happened. And don't <laughs> he got a thorn in his finger, quite rightly. No, so. it was his whole hands were all lacerated. It was <laughs> and he had bits sticking out. So, strange question: What's your favourite pest? Well, I'll let Doctor Death and Professor Death answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> That's Pippa and Alistair to the rest of the world. <laughs> Oh, Pepper's professor. I'm, I'm the student. <laughs> <laughs> I've also been called the angel of death, though, actually, which is pretty nasty as well when you think about it. Oh, what's, come on, Alistair, what's yours? What's your well, favourite? It's, it's a really interesting question because it gets into the realms of philosophy because... Um, <laughs> <laughs> OK. Certain pests, when they, are, when they are native to an area, they actually drive evolution. Um, some pest host pest interactions actually are responsible or partly responsible for the diversity of plants that we see because it's a process of natural selection. So if I had to say my my um, favorite pest, I think I would say aphid. Um, okay. but that's mainly because I sit and look outside my window every day and watch all the um, bluebirds eating all the aphids off the plum trees, which is uh, one of my favorite things to watch really, which is quite quite interesting to think really that um flocks of birds can just go through um groves of trees and clean all the pests out um pests off them it's really rather lovely there you go that's mm. you know, i was going to say aphid as well Maybe of course you were i was because i was thinking there's two things why it was aphid firstly because i love going around my roses and squishing them off about <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. psycho um, that's weird <laughs> And uh, secondly, um, mainly because of, like Alistair, I really enjoy watching um, blue tits and coal tits hanging upside down off my weeping silver birch, stripping all the aphids off of the leaves. And it's just really nice to watch. <laughs> Brilliant. You know, I, they fascinate me, I have to say. I mean, not, not the birds eating them, which I, I too enjoy watching, but, you know, the fact that they, for part of the, the time, they don't actually have to mate to have offspring so when you look at one innocent looking aphid on your roses and you think oh damn I've got aphids coming in you're actually looking at often you're looking at great great grandmother on the outside with great grandmother on the inside and then grandmother and then daughter and then 
baby because they're almost like Russian dolls. They've got several generations stacked up inside them. And if that's not clever in uh, success terms, I don't know what it is. I mean, they are literally breeding machines. And I always think, I don't know why people say breed like rabbits. I think they should say breed like aphids. <laughs> well, there we are. Aphids, the most popular pest. Uh... <laughs> Only because the birds eat them. <laughs> I must say, I like when I when I use water and spray them off the roses. I like watching them ping off onto the wall. I find that quite satisfying. I think you and uh, you and Sally should go out on an evening together. You know, <laughs> little aphid so, so, date. So, so you need to go out, go out a bit more generally. Do you know that? <laughs> I, the way I look at best. Max Pippa. Is I I love them all, you know, because if I if it wasn't for pests and diseases, I wouldn't have had the most amazingly lovely career that I've had. So I'm grateful to them, even if I sometimes curse them when they're in my own garden. Okay, then let's just flip that on its head. Least favorite, worst. I'm I'll. uh... I'm not going to say Xylella, even though that's why I completely changed my career, because I was so concerned about that one particular pathogen, which is indeed a very scary one. I, I'm going to go with uh, Phytophthora remorum. Again, it's a, um, a pest. Unfortunately, it was bought in or first identified in the UK in 2002. And that's, um, that's causing immense um, damage to our, our, our woodlands here in the UK. And again, that has multiple um hosts from conifers to broadleaf so uh yeah i'll go with phytophthora remora oh gosh i don't know i think i would i'm trying to think about what i get most wound up about at home and and whatever i say you know you're going to get the hate mail because in many people's eyes you shouldn't complain about or control anything but I have had a very big ongoing battle with deer, which now due to some fencing, I appear to have won, but they're probably climbing through it, under it, round it or over it as I speak. So I think I'm going to go for something smaller and that's vine weevil. I find them really insidious. They always look like they're dead because they're really good at playing dead. That's the adults. Secondly, anything that pretends it's got wings by having wing cases but actually can't fly is, a, you know, it's sort of in fancy dress all the time. Then it's got the most extraordinarily <laughs> grippy feet, which will allow them no issues to climb up the side of a, of a house up and attack the plants in your window boxes on, on your outside your bedroom window. And thirdly, the fact that I find this really hard because, you know, I'm female, as you might have noticed, but they are all women. And I hate them for that because that means, again, they don't need to find a male because there is, we believe, no such thing as a male vine weevil. And so they don't have to mate in order to produce viable eggs, which then hatch into those grim little plump c-shaped grubs with the gingery heads you find lurking in your compost when they've eaten all the roots off your plants and i haven't got the strength of character as a rampantly vegetarian for all my life sort of person to actually squish them on a one-to-one basis and as somebody said to me hear them go pop but I sort of wish I could because I really hate them. And instead, I have to spend a fortune on biological control to control them in my pots. And then I have to plant things in horribly shiny containers so that their nasty little grippy feet can't get up the side of them and lay their eggs. So I'm going for vine weevils. Well, I just think that's the best explanation to disliking a pest I've ever heard in my life. That was brilliant. What's that? That they're all women. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be, I would I would oppose that view. <laughs> Very unfeminist of you, Pippa. I mean, the problem is the problem is with being all women is that I probably didn't make that clear. I mean, of course they're best. Sorry, Alistair, because they're women. But the problem is it means they can all lay eggs, and if they can all lay eggs and they lay huge quantities of eggs that hatch into those little munchy grubs, and um, yeah, the birds like them on the bird table, but even then. Bah. Sally, do you have one? I'm just having to think about whether I've got I've got two that I dislike. 
One is in the wider landscape we've already mentioned, so ash dieback. It's devastating to me to see our countryside slowly ravaged and um, it's very upsetting. You only have to go on a walk with Alistair and he points it all out, you know. It's like, oh, there it is, there it is again, there it is again. <laughs> Dr. Death strikes again. Um, but from a personal point of view, it's slugs in my garden. I love Oh, hostas. slugs. I love hostas and um, I hate slugs. They've taken every single zinnia seedling, stripped the top off off the lot, mm. and I'm thinking they put so much effort into it, and they've just one night it's all gone. Oh. I'm going to share. I I found an interesting insect fact out this week that I'm going to share with you. Since we're talking about female insects, did you know? that the female dragonfly will dramatically fake its own death to escape unwanted advances from male dragonflies. Excellent tip. Good Thanks. girl. <laughs> all these dead women all up and down the country <laughs> just temporarily. <laughs> <laughs> so before we wrap up, one last question. What are the next steps for everyone listening? What can we do now to increase our knowledge and awareness? There's a lot of information out there that's already quite in depth, but what should we be looking out for? And what are the conversations we should be having about plant health? So everything that I say normally begins with a P. So um, DEFRA's plant health portal is a good one-stop shop for finding out about pests and diseases and also hosts of those pests and diseases. Um, And I think they're going to be updating it shortly. Um, And secondly is knowing about plant passporting. So there's your couple of P's as well. Um, (laughs) Nice alliteration there, Sally. Passporting. Um, Plant passporting is not only a traceability system for plants that move in trade, but also it uh, ensures that there's competency within those businesses um, that are moving plants in trade. So there's a certain amount of level of knowledge required. <clears throat> and I do believe that we have some very good online training. We do indeed. <laughs> Which is on the DEFRA plant health portal. Exactly. Um, developed in conjunction with our very own Alex Jenkins from HTA. Um, and that, that is really good starter, starter point for knowing about plant passporting, but also, you know, what you need to do and where you can look up. I would, um, we're just on the subject of e-learning modules is obviously the um, plant healthy e-learning modules, which which sort of um, relate nicely to the um, the plant passporting modules. Um, both are free, both um, sets of modules, you get a certificate at the end of, which is um, always a good thing. Uh, that's obviously aimed at professionals. What I think I would do is I would go to the International Year of Plant Health UK website and look for Izzy the Inspector um, book, which um, was produced as part of, part of the International Year of Plant Health. It, um, it's aimed at uh, children aged 6 to 11, so I, I have a natural affinity with it. Um, <laughs> It, uh, Were you in the focus group, Alistair? Uh, yeah, 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 I just crept in into the six-year age <laughs> end of the spectrum. Um, the uh, yeah, it's um, it's just a really nice explanation of what plant health is and what the various um, agents that we've talked about in terms of sort of disease-causing agents um, and such like. So yeah, that'd be my recommendation: plant health, um, plant healthy modules, and the plant passporting modules. For professionals and for the general public, I would go with Izzy the Inspector book, which is on the International Year of Plant Health website. Fantastic. I think just keep your keep your eyes and ears open, and and if you think something looks suspicious, then f- try and find out about it. And you know, the other two have suggested some really good sources of of information. And maybe if you're approaching it more from a a kind of gardening end of things, don't forget that there's some brilliant information out there in bookshops and on the internet and somewhere like um, the RHS's website is a really good source of reliable information with pictures to help you identify some of the pests and diseases, bit of information about their life cycle, some ideas on how you can prevent them or if you need to 
control them because it is all part of a balancing act. You know, we don't want to wipe out the less consequential insects just because they've taken the odd bite out of one or two of our plants' leaves. Because as Alistair was saying, you know, often they might be a, a really useful source of food for some of our lovely garden birds. But it is a sort of case of just trying to get yourself a bit more up to speed with what's what and what matters and what doesn't really matter and take what matters really seriously and start with that next holiday you take and don't even think about bringing back anything to do with plants unless it's a plant book or a scarf with a picture of a plant on it (laughs) (laughs) i just want to say a massive thank you to the three of you for joining me today um thank you sally pippa and alistair i've really enjoyed Um, our recording session I hope everyone listening has enjoyed it as well you have been listening to Hawk Talk a HDA podcast episode two on plant health episode three will be available from July the 15th and that is on young people in horticulture stay safe everyone take care